Thanks very much and good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone and thank you for joining us. Um, so on behalf of the co-hosts, uh, the Global Network of People Living with HIV, GNP+, Global Health Council and the NCD Alliance, a very well, warm welcome to the event entitled Non-Communicable Disease Integration in HIV Programming, Improving Quality of Life for People Living with HIV. My name is Katie Dane, I'm the CEO of the NCD Alliance and delighted to be kicking, on, kicking us off for this important discussion. We're gathering today um, as governments prepare to convene for the UN high level meeting on HIV and AIDS next week, where they will be reviewing progress made in reducing the impact of HIV since the last high level meeting in 2016 and adopting a new political declaration to guide further direction of the response. This presents an excellent opportunity uh, to ensure that stakeholders are aligned behind the need for promoting responsive health systems that put people at the heart of every programme. As the draft political declaration recognises, people living with HIV have an increased risk of NCD comorbidities, including but not limited to cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, a number of cancers and mental health conditions. And this cuts across all age groups. In some countries, half of those seeking HIV treatment also live with NCDs. The bi-directional -dire relationship between NCDs and HIV reduces quality of life, it undermines treatment outcomes, leads to premature mortality, and hinders progress towards the HIV targets. So today, during this event, we bring together both the HIV and the NCD communities to really explore the health-related quality of life approach for people living with HIV and NCD comorbidities, as well as really trying to discuss the, the key integration examples and opportunities for synergies in both responses, as well as investment cases that consider both impact and cost within existing HIV programmes. Of course, um, for this high-level meeting on HIV, the, the COVID pandemic provides an important context. As the world seeks to build back fairer and better from COVID, I think it's paramount, paramount that we take into consideration that underlying chronic health conditions, NCDs, aside from their own direct impact, have proven to exacerbate the impact of communicable diseases in many significant ways. And as we heard at the multi-stakeholder hearing in preparation for the HIV high level meeting, there is really a united call from civil society to ensure that lessons are learned from the pandemic to prioritize adequate funding to achieve universal health coverage, health system strengthening and integration at all levels. I think over the years, there is much that the NCD community has learned and continues to, to learn from the HIV AIDS movement. And in many respects, what we've seen over the last year is that we're very much aligned on our vision for a healthier recovery from, from COVID. And I'll just mention four points here in terms of the, the alignment of agendas that we've seen. Firstly, the increased focus on quality of life and well-being, and this is where we will pick up with our panellists today, um, and we especially thank today's speakers who will present their expert perspectives from their own personal experience. Secondly, the agendas um, meet around the need to invest in health systems and universal health coverage, particularly at the primary health care, care level. I think COVID has clearly shown the fault lines of health systems both in low-income countries, middle-income and high-income countries alike. Thirdly, um, our agendas meet around the need for a, a human rights-based approach, which has obviously been the bedrock of the AIDS response and must be for COVID and, and NCDs. It's clear that over the last year, people are facing the virus from very uneven starting points. And many of these inequalities and social determinants are similar for NCDs, for HIV AIDS and many other health issues. So to accelerate recovery uh, and resilience to future pandemics, it will be important that policy, legislation, regulation really target the key structural factors underlying these different health issues. And fourthly, our agendas meet around the need to involve um, and meaningfully involve people uh, with lived experiences and community engagement throughout the response, whether it be representation and decision-making bodies, advocacy, policy development, service design, monitoring and accountability and research, there's strong evidence from the AIDS response that involving affected communities is beneficial for health outcomes, for ensuring policies and programs are relevant, appropriate and sustainable. 
to this end, the NCD community has been working together with people living with HIV as well as mental health, TB and RMNCH communities to really highlight the need for cross-sectoral collaboration to achieve the health-related sustainable development goals and respond to COVID in an integrated and holistic way that goes well beyond the disease silos and vertical programmes, which were really the hallmark of the Millennium Development Goal era. And we're delighted to have seen some, some signs of progress recently with, with, for example, discussions on quality of life led by people living with HIV during the development of the new UNAID strategy for 21 to 26, and the latest WHO recommendations for service delivery, which include integration of care for diabetes and hypertension with HIV services. But this needs to be better anchored in the future not least as we look towards the new global fund strategy that's currently being developed. So at this high level meeting on HIV and beyond, um, we believe um, we have a valuable opportunity to both safeguard the decades of investment in HIV and accelerate progress towards the HIV targets, while simultaneously addressing evolving community needs through cost-effective evidence-based health interventions for NCDs. These two global health issues are, are very much intertwined and require integrated solutions. So in summary, we really hope to see a political declaration at this high level meeting that makes clear the, the growing impact of NCDs on the physical and mental health and well-being of people living with and at risk of HIV and on the sustainability and resilience of health systems, as well as providing a strong call for multilateral agencies, for governments, for all stakeholders alike to be integrating NCD screening, diagnosis and care to address the linkages with, with HIV. And, and with those brief opening remarks, it's now my pleasure to hand over to our moderator, Doug Webb, who's the team leader for HIV Health and Development at UNDP, who will be steering us through the, the rest of the programme. I'm sure for many of you, uh, Doug will be a very familiar, familiar face um, his career in global health has spanned working at Save the Children, UNICEF, currently at UNDP, and over the years he's worked on both the HIV AIDS response and the NCD response. So we're really delighted that Doug could, could join us and steer us through the rest of the programme. So over to you, Doug, and thank you. Thank you, Katie. Good morning, afternoon, everybody. Um, um, thank you to the NCDA, GNP Plus, and the GHC for inviting me along to help with this conversation today. Obviously, um, my my role here is to be uh, neutral and unbiased and uh, fair and uh, not have any opinions of my own. And to uh, and I can't promise to do any of that. I'm afraid um, I. I have lots of all of those opinions, and uh, but my job is to keep the conversation free flowing. I've been invested in these these questions for way too long now, so you'll have to uh, forgive me if I um, jump in at any point. Uh, this this th these are really important questions, um, and the HLM next week is is going to battle with this, and has been for some time in terms of the big questions of of integration efficiency. Um, and so what are we trying to do today? Well, the, you know, the HLM is, is, is recognizing really that the comorbidities actually do exist. And this is actually quite a step forward. Um, the recognition of the growing burden of comorbidities of co-infection, the lived experience of and, and non-communicable diseases, uh, particularly cancers, uh, particularly cardiovascular disease has just been said. Uh, and also risk factors, HIV, people living with HIV and tobacco use has always been known to be a, a, a risk association. And of course, HIV and alcohol use. These are no mysteries, just to, just to sort of start there. But, but where is integration? Um, we can't rely on universal health coverage to do everything for us. Uh, some would say that uh, it, you know, it is perhaps a threatening um, idea when you have the current arrangement where we have disease specific financing, mandates, institutions, uh, services, which are, you know, potentially protective of those arrangements. 
integration might be threatening to some, to the, to the current order, because there's an inertia built around disease specificities, what some might call silos or verticality. Integration can threaten or actually push those vertical arrangements um, aside. So uh, what is the HLM trying to do here five years on from the last one? Paragraph 66B, for those interested in the actual text, does acknowledge that uh, we should push towards full integration for uh, non-communicable services for people living with HIV. This is a huge step forward. The new global AIDS strategy does actually reflect this as well about full integration of NCD services for people living with affected by and at risk of HIV. But these are arguably um, HIV services reaching across the aisle. Um, it isn't a, a, a meeting of different service um, structures. So is this sufficient to ensure quality of patient care for everybody in, a, in an even balanced incrementalist uh, way? Um, at the same time, how should we, or how much can we expect of the HIV community to provide a full range of services to everybody? It's not necessarily fair for us to point at one disease constituency and say, right, well, you should fix everything. It's not, man they're not mandated to do that. Um, and how do we then uh, understand the nature of, uh, you know, the, the, the ask of one disease group to, to answer, to, to address all of these complex arrangements when the institutions themselves are not geared or, or requested or financed or capacitated um, as to do that. So how do we address the complexities of integration when the institutions themselves are not designed to do that? And, the, and the, 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 you know, we're, lef we're left nagging uh, health services on the ground to perform these functions when the, 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 the support globally isn't geared up to do that. Uh, that's where we are right now. So, so to address all these questions and provide all these simple answers to these questions, we've got a range of, of panelists and speakers today from civil society, from patients, from NGOs, from academia, from governments, from the UN um, to illuminate our understanding of all of this. Your questions will help us um, stimulate the minds and challenge us. Put, please put your questions in the, in the Q&A uh, box. We're gonna divide the conversation into two parts. The first one is to understand what is the, the need for integration on the ground? What does it look like? What is the, 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 the problem statement, if you like, from the experiences on in the patient service interface. And the second part is really about what is the institutional response required? What are governments doing? What is the international community doing? What is the, the nature of the response that we're, we're seeing? And what are the solutions uh, that are being put forward by um, those that have the authority and the power to do so? So hopefully we can at least arrive at some collective sense of, of progress by the end of the conversation. Um, so we've got five speakers in the first session, four speakers in the, in the second. And your inputs and interactions are more than more than welcome. So to get us going, um, I'm going to ask our first um, speaker, Sally Gallo, uh, is from our vo views of voices in uh, Kenya. And Sally, um, please share with us your experiences uh, from the Kenya perspective of what integration services, what, what integration services are actually needed on the ground? What, what, what is the experience from the patient perspective? Welcome, Sally. Thank you so much. And uh, I greet you all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Sally and I'm grateful today for this opportunity to talk about my journey with HIV and cervical cancer and colorectal cancer as well. I'm a survivor of three types of cancers. My objective is to inspire and give hope to everyone uh, all over the world who is suffering from HIV and cancer and any other uh, chronic condition. I'm grateful to God today to be alive, healthy and well, as you can see. 
Allow me to briefly share my story, and I hope it on, it's not only inspires you, but compels you to action. I was diagnosed with HIV in 1999 after I had lost two babies, uh, one at two months, another one at seven months, because at that time there were no uh, what we call prevention or mother to child prevention that we have right now. I went into deep depression following the pain that came with a lot of opportunistic infections from HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis, uh, happy zoster, pneumonia, name it. I also I almost went blind because of cytomegalovirus and I also had a very bad skin rash. I'm happy that my skin looks better today. I suffered a lot of, this, of stigma from my in-laws who accused me of being a murderer after my children had died. As a result, my husband and I separated. This stigma uh, only added salt to my very fresh wound and it took a toll on me. A series of events led to the loss of my husband. May his soul rest in peace. I lost hope and decided to end my life by throwing myself in the Indian Ocean. By God's grace, I was rescued and I made a choice to move on with my life and to support others in a similar situation. I get inspiration from support groups that I am involved in, being a patient advocate now. And there we are able to discuss and uplift each other with our stories and uh, share whatever we are going through. So supporting others has been a great way of enhancing my, enhancing my self-esteem, which had been drained by stigma and discrimination. So uh, as we concentrate on HIV prevention and treatment, which we can say has been well-funded and given a lot of focus and attention, let us not forget NCDs. For instance, uh, we are talking about cervical cancer. It is there in the papers, but when we go to the hospital during our um, comprehensive care clinics, it's not really taken seriously. But I can say that uh, I was initi initiated on antiretrovirals in 2003, and I've religiously taken them to date. I enjoyed fairly good health until 2007 when life took a turn on me. Just when I thought I was done with the heart and the pain of HIV diagnosis, I was diagnosed with stage two cervical cancer. And to your surprise, I did not have any symptoms at all. And it was just a routine check and I was told I already had, the, I was infected by the human papilloma virus and I had cervical cancer stage two. This was the beginning of a long, rough and many times uncertain journey. The sights and sounds of hospital rooms and corridors became a common place. Actually, the hospital was my other home. The agony of being stigmatized by, by those I thought I could depend on only added salt to my open wounds. I had reached the end of my tether. Many of those I have known on this journey have either passed away or are in circumstances worse than mine. And I've been through as, as many uh, cancer, cancer does not have to be a death sentence. It doesn't have to be a death sentence. I survived and today I call myself not just a survivor, but I'm a victor. My experience reveals that indeed cancer is curable. However, the burden of cancer and, then, and all the other NCDs in the world needs to be reduced. Early diagnosis, easy access to treatment facilities and support groups for the many people struggling with this disease need to be strengthened and enhanced. Though I remain with lifetime scars, uh, these are not physical sometimes. I walk around with a special bag. As I told you, I also went through colon cancer and because uh, it affected my rectum as well. So my rectum was removed and uh, I now walk around with a, a bag to collect my stool and a colostomy bag and each bag costs about uh, 600 Kenya shillings. Uh, and I need one or two in a day. And this is not readily available in the country and I guess many other African countries. I've personally experienced, um, I've seen patients dying, not because of their condition, but because of lack of some of these appliances. For, for instance, I've seen a lady who, just stopped eating. So she stabbed herself to death. 
So she didn't die because of cancer, but she died because of lack of the colostomy bag. I'm disclosing this to you today, not because I want to seek pity or sympathy from you, but to remind you how healthcare for some of us can be very expensive. I cry for myself and many others out there with no income and hence can't afford some of these appliances. So that I'm only talking about colon cancer. People with other uh, conditions and other NCDs are also going through the same. So I'm, I'm, I'm just sharing my own. Apart from supporting medicines, governments, ministries of health through the UHC needs to include much more in the comprehensive package and not just medicines. We are grateful for the medicines, but as you realize, there are many other things that needs to be included as well. The support of family and friends and um, uh, my employer then uh, give me uh, hope to, to continue living a, a, a normal life. When we support each other and we, when we all do all our part, then the burden is much lighter to those of us living with these chronic conditions, HIV included. It is my hope that this meeting brings out positive outcomes, results that are going to impart positively to the lives of people living with HIV. I hope our lives can, can be made better now with the UHC. For example, as a, my message to the whole world and to policymakers is that no woman should die of cervical cancer. It is easily detectable, it is easily treatable, and therefore we need to create a lot of awareness out in our communities so that every woman gets screened in time. Governments and all stakeholders need to explore all ways to make our lives easier and affordable. More investments are required for disease prevention programs and not just curative. If we prevent more people from getting sick then a lot of money that is used to buy medicine which comes from our pockets and from the governments and stakeholders will be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, as I finish, I take this opportunity to thank the NCD Alliance for inviting me to this meeting today. This is a great experience to me and I feel so honored. My humble request is to continue inventing in involving more and more people living with HIV and NCDs into such forums. Give us a rich plus platform to share our views, our voices, as well as participate effectively and meaningfully. Together we can achieve more. And my plea to every man and woman and everyone, it's possible, it's time for action. It's time for us to control these diseases. This is possible if you and I come together and make that decision. Uh, and for all of us get tested early as early diagnosis saves lives. As I've shared, it saved mine. And as I finish, I would want to end with a parting shot that the best warrior is not the one who always wins, but the one who is not afraid to go back to the battle. I suffered HIV and cancer and came out a warrior. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Sally. Uh, thank you for that testimony, you're a victor indeed. Uh, and you've reminded us really of the uh, the importance of, of universal health coverage and the and the commodities that it entails. Um, these are low cost items. Uh, the screening is low cost in many cases. And the commodities that uh, need to follow are low cost too. Um, and this is really about the importance of getting the systemic responses right, the supply chains right, the financing right. Um, these are spent on on HIV, and it's it's. It's not acceptable when other conditions are not given the same attention uh, and the quality of life is, is, is suffered uh, is the consequence. Thank you, Sally, for that testimony. Very powerful. Thank you. Um, Aditya Wadhana uh, is the executive director of the Indian AIDS Coalition. Um, please, again, share your experiences and the challenges uh, that you have yourself have faced uh, as a living these experiences. Aditya, how are you? Hi, Doc. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity for me to sharing my journey. And good evening, good morning, and good afternoon for all of you. So uh, my name is Aditya Wardana, and I work as an executive director of Indonesia AIDS Coalition, not India AIDS Coalition. 
I'm from Indonesia. I've been living with HIV since 2005, and since then, uh, under the ARV treatment. I was an injecting drug user and most likely uh, got my HIV from this past activity. In addition to the HIV, I also contracted uh, hepatitis C, which luckily had been carefully treated. Yeah. But in 2012, I was diagnosed with the pulmonary hypertension, a type of high, high blood pressure that affect the artery in your lung and the right side of your heart. This is a rare disease. Yeah. This rare uh, cardiac disease is hard to be diagnosed. In Indonesia, I had to consult with more than 15 doctors in my country just to find out what the condition was. My history with injecting drug user was suspected to be the cause of my pulmonary hypertension because of the cardiac regurgitation. In 2012, in my country, Indonesia, we only have one, uh, one doctor specializing in this type of cardiac disease. And the doctor need to perform a chest x-ray test, electrocardiogram, echocardiography, and other cardiac catheterization to me, and continue with CT scan, MRI, blood test, and lung biopsy, which was not covered by our national health insurance because of my HIV status. So at that time, I was struggling to manage the payment. The doctor, and then after diagnosed me with the pulmonary hypertension, uh, prescribed me with the sildenafil to manage the blood artery for my artery to be controllable. This medicine, unfortunately, was very expensive. I had to spend around 600 uh, US dollar for this each month that drove me to the point that uh, I sometimes go to the Bangkok just to buy three until six months worth of supply of sildenafil. As I joined the pulmonary hypertension support group, I found out that many of us living with this disease never get diagnosed and die. With another painful last number of us, also face difficulty in assessing medicine due to high price and the availability of the drugs that only limited in big city in Indonesia. Throughout my journey with HIV and pulmonary hypertension, I learned that many of my people living with HIV friends die not because the HIV, but because the late diagnosis of cardiac related disease. It was never easy to live a life with these two deadly diseases. And it is my greatest hope for this disease to be able to gain more attention such like I see in the HIV field. In, in conclusion, I would like to request a solid, solidarity action to better address HIV and other non-communicable disease. HIV has affected people different and we need to address it differently in the spirit to left no one behind. Thank you. That is my story and back over to you, Doc. Thank you. Aditya, thank you again. Um, another victor survivor and um, uh, your, your story illuminates a particular issue again, which is, is highly important and coming to the fore and that is around the issue of, of financing and insurance. Um, which you seem to have uh, been, in a sense, a, a sort of victimized, a victim from uh, not having the insurance coverage for the, the treatments. Uh, there is more and more attention on the social protection issue uh, coming, to, and the, the high level meeting document does stress the importance of social protection for people living with HIV. And I'm wondering how far this will stretch. Um, in terms of coverage of uh, treatments and uh, commodities and support when those conditions are uh, not directly HIV related, but associated uh, in, uh, related to other conditions. And we may have to push very hard under the auspices of social protection under regards to universal health coverage. Um, if the argument is put forward that these are not directly related to HIV, but in, in in the people living with HIV when they're actually non-communicable diseases and comorbidities. So there may be a long fight ahead 
when it comes to social social insurance for people living with HIV, mm-hmm. when those conditions are um, arguably comorbidities or co-infections or co-conditions or multimorbidities, um, and we need to we need to look at that whole area. Um, so thank you for illuminating um, you know the the suffering that you and other millions of other people are. are are enduring because of this issue of financing and limited financing and insurance. Aditya, thank you and good and good strength to you. Um, we're going to switch our attention to Southern Africa, which has been obviously the epicenter of this um, pandemic for a long time now. Robert Salato um, is the head of the National AIDS and Health Promotion Agency. Robert, uh, you're going to um, try and look at how the how do you address this from the national HIV AIDS, uh, you know, perspective from government level? There's a lot of pressures on you. You, you know, you're trying to accommodate a lot of different interests. You've got a high HIV burden in your in your population. Uh, how do you cope with this 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 challenge in in your in your budgeting in your work? Uh, share your share your challenges with with us, Robert. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone, and good evening. Um, let me first say thank you to the to this opportunity um, um, for the NCDI Alliance and the Global Network for People Living with HIV, and for the you know for for even provide this platform for us to to speak today. Um, Botswana has an estimated population of around two point four million. And out of this 2.4 million, uh, we have 374,000 people living with HIV and prevalence of about 18.5%, uh, which is definitely one of the highest in the world. We're actually the third highest in the world. Um, in terms of our performance against the UN is 1990. Uh, as of uh, using 2020 data, it is estimated that we are around 92, 95, 98, meaning uh, 92% of the population who have tested for HIV, uh, 95% of those that are positive are actually on antiretrovirals, and we have 98% uh, viral suppression for those on treatment. Um, the recent estimates also further indicate that uh, in terms of new infections, we have decreased the new infections by 37% from 2010 and decreased uh, the AIDS-related deaths by around 22% from 2010. And here we are talking about 5,100 uh, annual deaths. Um, in terms of uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, uh, coverage remains very high in Botswana at around 98%. And mother-to-child transmission, the MTCT, is below 2%. So we have done quite well. Although Botswana shows these impressive uh, results, um, that I've just indicated. And the epidemic, you know, we, we've been able to arrest the epidemic and we've been able to improve the quality of life of those that are living with HIV. Um, but now there's an emerging concern that uh, we have a, a, the high mobility and mortality of people living with HIV and in the general population as a result of uh, the double burden of HIV and NCDs. So um, NCDs now are emerging as a, as a big challenge. With the access to antiretroviral therapy, like I've, I've mentioned, now people have people live longer and live a, a good quality of life, and therefore do not usually uh, die from HIV-related causes, but will mainly die from uh, your diabetes, the cancers, and so forth, which are our NCDs. And it has been established that uh, these diseases are responsible for more deaths in Botswana uh, than uh, HIV, as, as, uh, as I've also mentioned. And this is from the WHO um, country profile. So in re- response to the above, the government of Botswana expanded the mandate of uh, the then um, National AIDS Coordinating Agency and constituted what now we call uh, the National AIDS and Health Promotion Agency under the office of the president. And this was so that uh, we address the issue and challenge of non-communicable diseases and uh, ensure that uh, non-communicable diseases are integrated uh, into HIV programming and also improve the quality of life of those living with HIV and so that they benefit from you know, arresting the two conditions simultaneously. Um, currently we have the NCD strategy and the national strategic framework 
for HIV, which were both launched by the president of Botswana in 2019. And these remain, remain our guiding frameworks as we move forward to addressing the issue of NCDs and HIV in the country. Um, so we are trying to leverage from our experience with uh, HIV and see how we can apply that to addressing NCDs. And the approach here by the country is to integrate the two um, by riding on the existing HIV response master sexual engagement and strong community-led approaches, which is which mainly you know would involve our CSOs or uh, uh, civil society organizations. This model provides a multi-disease screening and testing packages for HIV and NCDs in the general population, and this is done by civil society groups and uh, which have traditionally been focusing on HIV. Now we are retooling them to also focus on, on NCD screening and testing. We are now capacitating them on all the broad NCD issues. And to date, um, just to share uh, what we've also done is that we have developed and launched the national guideline for implementation of integrated community-based health services. The guidelines promote an integrated approach to community-based uh, health service delivery and standardized uh, minimum package for community-based interventions. Um, we have also uh, developed an integrated curriculum for community health care workers that include NCD issues. Uh, here we are speaking to screening for risk factors and so forth and so forth. Um, the WHO country office is currently providing technical support uh, for the country to develop the investment case for NCDs. We hope this um, um, uh, we hope uh, uh, that uh, this investment case will help us. You know, when we are soliciting funds and resourcing uh, for for NCDs. Um, you recall that um, the whole of, like I said, most of these strategies were launched in 2019, and the whole of 2020 we are dealing with. Uh, COVID. So there was not much implementation uh, you know, of these strategies. And we are hoping this year and next year we'll have uh, better experiences to share to say how is the integration uh, uh, happening. But um, as I conclude, maybe, is that uh, COVID-19 has also shown us that uh, it's very important for us to, to integrate and that uh, multi-sector participation uh, is very critical. And this is why uh, as a country now we've moved forward uh, to integrate all strategies that address pandemics into existing uh, 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 structures like the uh, local, our local authorities and districts planning and other community-based organizations you know, so that they are part of the response. Today, we are also working with uh, our traditional HIV partners and CS, uh, at the and CSOs or, or civil society organizations to provide services for COVID. So um, learnings from HIV are being used for COVID mitigation. Uh, we are also using them for NCD mitigation. So it's really a, an issue of how do we leverage on existing knowledge that we have and the good practices that we've, we've maintained uh, uh, throughout the past. So HIV has provided that platform in terms of research, research as well, uh, resource mobilization, uh, uh, um, HIV has taught a very good experience. And we have quite a number of people that um, in terms of human resource that have done quite successfully in the landscape of HIV. So we are trying to benefit from all that and have NCD you know, be elevated to that level and uh, see how it's, it can be better coordinated. It can be better coordinated from a higher structure. Like I'm saying, now uh, the office sits under uh, office of the president. Therefore, NCDs are taken at that level, um, uh, including COVID as well. So this is how we, we plan to integrate. And moving forward, uh, I think we need to agree that um, going to the future, the HIV epidemic has matured and people will not die out of uh, uh, AIDS, but will die of other causes. Therefore, we need to now start looking at what do we do today now that uh, in terms of access, people are accessing treatment uh, 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 quite easy, coverage is quite high. Therefore, what do, how do we deal with the other secondary issues like uh, NCDs and what good learnings we can borrow from HIV? Thank you so much. Uh, Robert Kerobocha, um, fantastic. Um, I mean, we, uh, we, look, we always looked at Botswana 
we looked at Botswana for experiences on integration on the ground. You've got a good decentralized structure, strong primary health care. I mean, the HIV, tuberculosis, diabetes, hypertension connections are, are obviously there. So, you know, how you use civil society on the ground to work with primary health care structures around the links with, for example, hypertension screening, I think are going to be very important. So mm -hmm. the integration on the ground and, and, you know, the SADAC community has a lot to learn from Botswana always has. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so good luck with your, with your efforts. And I know you've got very strong political leadership as well. So um, Thank you. you're, you're, you're a leader in the region there. So good luck to your efforts. And um, we look to, we also look forward to the investment case. We know how powerful the investment case approach has been in the NCD arena. So, yeah. so thank you again. Um, thank you again, Robert. Thank you. Um, thank you. So stick, much. stick around. There'll be some questions, I'm sure. Um, our next speaker, we're running a little, little bit behind time, but we'll crack on. Um, Rachel, um, well known to all of us, Rachel Nugent is the Vice President at uh, RTI, Research Triangle Institute. Um, and Rachel, what is the economics of all of this? Um, where is the efficiency gain and in integration? What do we know about the economics? Uh, in five minutes, can you just convince us that this makes economic sense? Rachel. Thanks very much, Doug. And I am going to see if I can share my screen uh, to show you a little bit about what we know on the economics of all this. Oops, uh, not the one I wanted, but let's see uh, if we can make it work. Okay. Um, and I assume that you're seeing my screen with a slide that says integration and quality of life. Okay, good to go. Thanks, and I will move through these fairly quickly. Yes, my, my role in this is to talk about the economics and uh, it has come up already. I want to, to first acknowledge that the academic papers and the work that we do as researchers really pales in comparison to Aditya's and Sally's stories because they're telling us what is actually happening to people, what, what is affecting their quality of life. Fortunately, what we're seeing in the evidence mirrors that story. The conclusions are the same. We're seeing, as you can see in this slide, there's a lot here, but really the bottom line is to improve quality of life, we have to address the economic aspects because it's bad enough when people are suffering from poor health and the fear that arises and, uh, and on all of the things that arise from poor health. But when you don't even know whether you can pay for your health care, whether you can access the health care, that creates a much more dramatic and, and, and difficult situation. So the evidence is showing us from many countries here, we have uh, papers representing uh, the situation in Uganda and Rwanda, the Western Pacific uh, region, showing us that people have to spend much more, particularly those who have an NCD. So when people without HIV, or without an NCD spend roughly 10% of their income on their health care, it rises to 50% of their income in the Western Pacific region when they have both of those conditions that they're dealing with. And from elsewhere, we see similar situations. So we know that the financial aspects are a burden. The out-of-pocket payments are way too high, particularly for the NCD care. And we have a bit of a train wreck on the financing side. We know that there's very little donor financing for NCDs. We've studied this over the years, and, and, and it's roughly 2% of what donors are contributing to global health when we know that the NCD burden is much higher than that. We also know that donors are strained in paying for the HIV services that have been provided, that, that those funds are dwindling or at risk. And of course, the, the, the financial burden, the responsibility lies with the countries themselves who need to, to care for their populations. But that's a challenge, and a continuing challenge and an intensifying challenge. So let me speak about investment cases. It's been mentioned a few times before. Our team, in collaboration with Doug's team, have conducted investment cases on NCDs and NCD risk factors in many countries. There are also investment cases for HIV, TB for other areas of health, but there is not an integrated investment case. This slide tells us that we can have success in making policy change with investment cases. And these are some examples from the NCD field that we've been working in, where it gets the attention of the minister, the prime minister, the finance minister, it builds coalitions, it advances policies and cha policy change 
especially when that policy change is teed up by discussions like this and communities that have come together as, as we have to talk about what's needed. So investment cases can be very important, but we have at this point, um, and as Robert said, it can, it can help raise funds. We have at this point, too limited experience with an integration investment cases. It just isn't there. What do we do know on the economic side though? That does feed into an investment case. So we know about the costs and something about the cost effectiveness of integration. We know for instance that HIV and NCD integration has become uh, un understood as needed um, it can be effective. It's being tried out in many countries because countries know that that's what populations and patients need. We know that there is a good return on investment <clears throat> for HIV care and for many types of NCD care. And the charts and figures here, there's a lot of details. It's not really to, to get into the details. That's not this, this talk. But to show you that those red bars there, which are um, across different types of HIV services, show a high return on investment in LMICs, low and middle income countries for providing HIV care. And the numbers on the bottom right are produced by one of our investment cases that we've done with Doug's team, this one in Jamaica, again, showing a good return on investment for different kinds of NCD services and care, whether it be cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mental health conditions and so on. So we have positive return on investment, but we have very limited evidence of what happens when we put those together. And also the focus so far in the work on integrated care on the economic side has focused on the cost and the cost effectiveness. And that's only one piece of it. We need to look at the, uh, the, the equity, the quality of life the equity effects. And so what we need actually is to compare a non-integrated system with an integrated system of care, not just the service delivery, but all the systems. So to sort of wrap up, I wanna talk about the synergies that can come from systems integration. And what we want to see is how do we look across health systems, not just again, the service delivery. Um, we want to center on the, the quality of life. And that means all of these different aspects of health systems. The service delivery there at the top, of course, is important, but the health workforce, the information system, the medicines, availability of other supplies and medicines, as people have said, the financing that Doug has brought up several times, and of course, leadership and governance. So we know that the return on investment, if we are actually integrating across these systems, uh, is likely to be very high because we will have much more alignment, coordination, and a ability to find efficiencies. We haven't shown it yet, but there's lots of reason to believe that this would be a very positive return on investment because we look over time, we look at equity and how we can change systems to achieve UHC. So of course it's gonna look different in different countries. Each of these circles may not need the same amount of integration in every place, but we do know that we can achieve some better uh, quality of life for patients if we provide them with more integrated care. And we'd like to demonstrate that with the economic numbers. Over to you, Doug. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think the, the basic message is that we need to invest in uh, understanding what these efficiency gains would look like. Uh, we, we haven't quite got to that point that the overall system is incentivized to fully calculate these these invest these efficiency gains, um, perhaps because the incentives aren't necessarily aligned to fully investigate them, as I was as hinting earlier on. But we 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 understand that those those efficiencies are there to explore, uh, and integration is a win win win. Um, and we need to galvanize ourselves to, to, to fully understand them from a systems perspective. Um, so thank you for, for laying that out for, for us, Rachel. Um, we will continue in that vein, I, I hope, to, to get there. Um, I see our last speaker in the in the session, um, Ambassador John Arno Rottingen, I hope I've pronounced that um, correctly, um, from uh, the health ambassador from Norway's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. John Arna, you, you, you come from a, a government who's really championed um, 
global health, um, you know, historically, and you still do. So welcome to this conversation. And it's, it's great to get your perspectives on, you know, where does you know, your particular government and your perspectives on where does integration sit in the landscape of, uh, you know, the global fund or the, the global financing facility, or, you know, where do we, where does, where do you see integration going um, in, in amongst all of these different funding arrangements and the, the HLM next week? What can you, what's your crystal ball looking like on this one? Welcome. Thanks, Doug, uh, and thanks for inviting me to speak at this uh, important meeting uh, in the run-up to the high-level meeting. Um, and as we've heard from the powerful sharing from Sally and Aditya, uh, many people who live with both HIV and chronic NCDs face very serious challenges affecting their health, but also their wider well-being. And they need access to integrated and comprehensive health services for their different conditions, uh, well documented. Um, and as we know, not all countries can deliver such broad services of good quality and, and not under a social protection or a universal health coverage model. So it's a lot of work to do. Um, and during the World Health Assembly, we, which ended earlier this week, we heard that many developing countries are seriously lagging behind on the, the SDG 3.4 on reducing NCD mortality. Um, and only 15 countries are on track to meet the, the target. So we have a lot to do uh, on the NCD space. Um, but as you mentioned, Doug, in many ways, for, for the past couple of decades, Norway has taken a strong interest and role on global health matters, but in particular on efforts to expand childhood vaccination, to improve maternal and child health, uh, to ensure safe childbirth, and to reduce the, the most deadly infectious diseases, such as HIV, and, and of course, TB and malaria. And, and I think a lot has been achieved collectively, globally, uh, with clear results, but uh, uh, we uh, we also see that there is a considerable change and evolution in the global disease burden, um, and for that reason, Norway saw the need to also add NCDs uh, in uh, as a priority in our development cooperation policy. So, just a couple of months before the pandemic um, started, the Norwegian government not not good timing, but still. Hard to tell. Uh, the Norwegian government relaunched a new strategy called Better Health, Better Lives, combating NCDs in the context of Norwegian development policy. And, and by doing that, we are actually the first donor country uh, with a clear specific strategy on NCD action in developing countries. Uh, and we are now currently working on implementing this strategy and uh, NORA, the, our development uh, agency, has uh, adopted a program for the period uh, now on towards 2024. Um, to some extent, our work was though put to hold because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but we now see, of course, that the action points that were included in the strategy, they are really important also in the battle against COVID-19. Because we need to strengthen health systems in low-income countries, we need strong primary health care capacities. We need to prevent and reduce risk through multi-sectorial measures and we need to increase the access to good health information systems. Um, and we really hope that other countries will follow our example um, because there is a strong need for scaling up NCD prevention and health care. Um, um, and despite the large disease burden in low and middle income countries, NCD efforts um, only constitute around one to two percent of health development aid currently. So we are, as a country, interested in exploring potential partnership with other countries uh, and with agencies and organizations to have more collective impact. Because of course we are only one country and 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 uh, and a small one. Um, so we will also cooperate with civil society organizations, both local organizations as well as international ones. And we believe that is very important. Uh, it's important to involve communities and, and civil society. You spoke about NCDs and the Global Fund or, or maybe other of the uh, global health financing mechanisms. Um, and as a part of the NCD strategy, we, we actually have some of our goals to, to influence and work with the global health financing initiatives like the fund uh, to, so that they can strengthen their emphasis on comorbidities and on NCDs. And as you know, the Global Fund already has ongoing programs, which include uh, NCD diagnostics and treatment, 
uh, we heard Sally's story about cervical cancer um, and, and HIV and, and the uh, comorbidity there. The Global Fund has a program on cervical cancer screening uh, and we definitely, that has been quite successful in many countries. Um, hypertension is another NCD with clearly um, a need for the Global Fund uh, to also take action uh, given the, the high risk of blood, uh, high blood pressure uh, among HIV uh, patients. Um, and that actually one third of people living with HIV uh, seem to have hypertension. Um, so in order to improve the health of people living with HIV, we need to include care and active screening of NCDs as an integrated part of HIV programs, including interventions, uh, both on prevention and treatment and care side. But of course, also vice versa, we should also integrate HIV care in existing primary health care programs that deliver uh, NCD services. So supporting and financing integrated primary health care services can achieve synergies, like we just heard from Rachel, when it comes to medicine supplies change, health, health personnel capacities, health information systems, patient education, and also the co-design of services uh, between healthcare professionals and, uh, and patients. Um, but we have said this before. Um, in, we looked back and in 2011, in the UN General Assembly in the high level meeting, uh, there was an agreement to seek to integrate responses to HIV AIDS and non-communicable diseases. This call was repeated in 2014. It was repeated in 2018, almost with the same wording. And now 10 years later, we need to translate um, these words into political action and, um, and, uh, and implementation, um, as you alluded to. So we have a huge challenge in front of us and we can only deliver on the SDGs, uh, including the goal of universal health coverage. If we ensure a comprehensive and integrated approach where we strengthen health systems that offer both prevention and care uh, and treatment for all the main diseases uh, and for all who need them. Um, and I think we need to work systematically with the different external health financing instruments to support countries in doing this and delivering integrated services. So thank you, Doug. Thank you, Ambassador. And you, you reminded us about the, the overall ethics here of full universal health coverage being our, our ultimate goal. If we're only talking about the integration of NCD services into HIV services, which is you know, so much more funded ultimately, at the, mo well, at the moment, we're looking at a perverse situation where your chances of getting treatment for, for your cancer are magnified if you are also living with HIV, um, which is you know, a simply unethical position and, if you, uh, we, and which we can't tolerate. Um, so thank you for reminding us of, of the, the moral imperative that we have of pushing a holistic, comprehensive, systemic response. Um, and, and pointing out the, the ethics of, of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, thank you, Ambassador, for that. We've got a, a couple of uh, minutes. We're way, we're way behind, as always, with these things, um, scrambling to catch up. A couple of questions I want to address that have come in. We haven't mentioned young people at all, of course. Of course. Unfortunately, during this conversation, um, Teja Sefer, I think, pronounced that correctly, said, where's young people um, services here? Um, Sally, I, can I, maybe you can address this and your experiences with the support groups and the Kenya situation. Have young people been involved? Are these services reaching out for young people? Maybe you can just address where, where are young people fitting into these um, services? Just, just briefly maybe uh, touch on this, this question of young people being supported. Yeah, I can say that uh, we have support groups for young people in, in our country, Kenya, but in the comprehensive care clinic, uh, I can say that something is still lacking because they're not given that uh, uh, special separate attention because you know, sometimes the young, the youth, they, are, they have self stigma, they're, most of them have not accepted. So it would be good if they would be given maybe their own clinic appointments or their own time to, because their, their needs are different from the others. But yes, we have some uh, support groups in our country, Kenya. And this is going to become a you know a, a growing issue. We can't pretend that you know that non-communicable diseases are only a, a 
a condition of you know old people like me you know this is you know the age range is getting younger and younger all the time mm. uh, yeah. the hypertension is getting coming down and cancers coming down the age ranges all the time uh, second issue that's been brought up uh, is that uh, of of the digital health telehealth um, innovations which have been propelled by COVID actually and business continuity during COVID is certainly something in UNDP that we've been helping governments through this difficult period in advancing business continuity through digital uh, support services and it's certainly in the health sector this has been a huge area of demand that we've been helping governments uh, with. Um, maybe Robert I don't know whether you feel that you know in your conversations with in, in government and in terms of your seeing that Digital health, telehealth, uh, this is something that you see as being uh, an aid, a tool in, in the integration question in terms of mobile apps, tel, you know, the cell phone networks. And this is something that you see as being assisting in the integration question and holistic patient records and digitization and so on. You're on mute still, sir. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, I think that's the, the new direction that everybody has to head. And um, unfortunately, um, COVID-19 forced, forced us to look that direction as well. Uh, in our country where electronic um, platforms uh, for, for, for saving data, for, for managing patient data, and also for accessing information have been limited. Now more than ever, we are challenged to see how we could facilitate, um, you know, tele ways of doing things, uh, uh, telemedicine, um, ease what whatever, and using technology really to, you know, to uh, to provide services. Um, we are tracking the landscape where today we are even saying, um, how do we ensure that we continue spreading the prevention messages when we can't even access schools because of the COVID. Uh, uh, mitigation process, uh, procedures. How do you now interact with the community when you can't assemble people more than 50? How do you then you know, engage people in a workshop and teach or you know, provide capacity building when now you can't meet with anyone physically? So technology now becomes the solution and this is the new direction where now we need to, where we, where we need to move to. And thanks to COVID in a, <laughs> In another way, now uh, countries have started saying, how do we embrace technology? And we have started also uh, as a ministry uh, to see how now we can manage our patient records because you know what we used to do in the past, you come with your, your hospital card, uh, you, you go with that to the hospital and the doctor will sort of scribble and write your prescription there, you go with it at home and so forth. But now we are trying to you know limit touching and you know exchanging material. So, this is challenging us to say, how do we ensure that your information remains in some sort of electronic device and um, doctors everywhere or the medical personnel can access it. Then we have sort of moved that direction. Right now we can dispense and uh, uh, we do dispensaries uh, through, through technology and so forth. We have good systems for that. Um, we also have um, a system where now when it's time for you to refills, you get an SMS pop-up to tell you that come and get your, your medication, your test results. Once they're ready, there's an SMS pop-up to say, come and collect your test results for whatever, because routinely we have people living with HIV being, uh, uh, you know, undergoing some clinical test. So I think that's uh, the direction that everyone has to move to. Thank you. I think uh, we, underst we understand that this is the future and uh, we're scrambling to find effective tools and models which are interoperable and uh, usable and, uh, and you know, fit into a growing network. Robert, thank you. Panelists, thank you very much. Uh, you've been wonderful. Um, we will skip seamlessly into the next panel. We haven't got much time. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask uh, our next speaker, Iram, are you there? Iram Zaidi from PEPFAR, is the Deputy Coordinator of the Office of the US Global AIDS Coordinator. And what we're doing in this session is looking at what the big organizations are doing in response to this question of integration. How are we, how are we institutionally responding? So Ira, we've always looked at PEPFAR for the big money, the big answers, the big reach, um, ever since what, 2003? 
Um, so how is PEPFAR leading the way? Erin, welcome. Thank you, and it's great to be here, everybody. It's actually our 18th year of PEPFAR. Um, we were joking about moving from adolescence to now a teenager and uh, a young adult. And I think this is a really critical conversation to have at this time. So thank you for inviting PEPFAR to share experiences in um, over the really the past 18 years of implementation of life-saving treatment and prevention um, for high disease burden uh, diseases across the countries that we've been talking about. Sally and Aditya, thank you for sharing your experiences earlier and, and the panelists um, from the previous session, really instructive conversations that um, we've been having and as we've been implementing over the past 18 years. I just want to share a few a few pieces around um, around the program. So since PEPFAR started, um, and if we just think back to 2004 and the availability of prevention and treatment services for HIV, they were very nascent. And what's amazing now, and we heard from our colleague in Botswana, is that countries are now reaching and going beyond the 90-90-90 UNAIDS goals to now 95-95-95. And we see that across many of the countries uh, that PEPFAR is working in and working closely with host country government and global fund and really amazing impact, not only on a population level, but then for individuals as we've heard um, for today. What we've evolved and what our data are showing and coming out of our FIA surveys is that HIV treatment services have scaled. People who are receiving ARVs are over 80% ART coverage in the highest disease burden countries, but even more importantly, that there are quality services and the way we measure that is through viral suppression. And those who are on treatment are virally suppressed. So it's impacting their own life and it's impacting ongoing transmission. What it took to do that is really detailed pieces. And I appreciate the slide from RTI showing um, that intersection of the individual with the health system and services all around. We've had to work through every single one of those pieces to really move and where PEPFAR originally started and this population and public health approach for HIV prevention and treatment services now to a client-centered approach that we've been implementing for over four years. Through our FIA data, we were able to identify which populations were not receiving the quality services that they needed and then evolve each and every one of those services to meet them where they were. We see that the health system, what we saw was that the health system was functioning maybe for 70% of individuals, but there were 20%, 30% who were being left behind. And we needed to now evolve ourselves and our systems and our service delivery to meet their needs. And so over the past few years, over the past four years, we've had to uh, resolve and identify how to provide HIV treatment services for life, not just for the pregnant woman who comes in for nine months during her different, during her different um, uh, childbearing years, but HIV treatment service for life for women. And what does that entail? How do we make sure that they are able to bring their children in and have services that meet their needs in the time that they have? We had to evolve our programs not to just treat men who have TB, but men who have HIV, identify them earlier in the course of disease so they do not develop TB, TB they do not develop other uh, OIs and when they're finally diagnosed are already very sick. So these are the detailed pieces over the past four years that we've worked through. Um, each country is different, each district is different, each urban area is different, each rural area is different. And those solutions, they can be on a clinical service perspective, they could be on a health, uh, on a health information services, um, data, supply chain, each one of these factors that then result in better quality of service for individuals. So prior to COVID, um, and as we were reaching these goals laid out by UNAs in 90-90-90, we were recognizing, and it was an instructive conversation earlier as well, about not only the aging population 
we have over 20% of the people that we're providing HIV treatment services to are over 50. 25% for men are over 50. So also important information to take into consideration as we're having these higher level political declaration and discussions and where, where do these services fit? How do they need to come in? And when we talk about integration of services, we really need to put the client at the center to say, okay, how do we actually provide services in a way that fit their needs? And they don't have to, you know, we all have to navigate our own health systems in our countries, but how can we bring those barriers down and ensuring that um, services can be provided in ways that are easy, um, not only for, for prevent, not only for treatment, but also for prevention of NCDs, because that is a critical aspect. So as we evolved and in these countries and at the district level where we were reaching 90-90-90, we've been integrating screening for cervical cancer and treatment now for cervical cancer, screening for diabetes and hypertension, as well as hepatitis C. So we've been layering these services because we see a need not only for the aging population, but for others that um, staying in HIV treatment is really important. And how can we provide services to individuals who are busy, who have, um, have you know, families and jobs and mobility and all of these other factors to, to really address bringing these services to them in a way that, that um, fits the models that they need for their own services. And so as we, as we have been doing that, we've also been working through um, the aspects of, of uh, this public health approach to individual level services. And I think uh, training of healthcare workers and uh, sites that are accessible and available, uh, not just four hours of the day, but actually eight hours, early morning hours where people who have jobs can actually come in and access services. We saw that we had to evolve our services for men because uh, a ten, a not, an eight to 12 did not work for men who have, um, who have occupations and need to be at their, at their occupation. So having sites opening up at six o'clock in the morning so that we can actually provide services not only for HIV, but then as we've been talking about NCDs incorporating um, those aspects. And then during COVID, uh, we all had to, we all made critical um, real-time adaptations and ensuring that the services that the HIV populations that we were serving were able to consistently receive their drugs in a, in, a, in a timely manner, in a reliable manner that they knew and they could expect. One of the policies that were really critical that we've been working on and we appreciate WHO and, and all of the policy work that, that they've been working on you know, since you know, this is their aspect of, of policies and bringing research into practice, and we operationalize those policies and work with host country governments to have these operationalized at a site at a site level. Um, two critical policies. One was a multi-month dispension. Not only a prescription of multi-month medicine for HIV, but actually having the client being able to pick up and walk away with a six-month supply if they're healthy, their viral load is suppressed have a six month supply of HIV medicines and come back, to the, come back to the facility for their annual HIV clinic assessment. Hey, Ram, we I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up. I'm sorry, can you? Sure, I'm up. just on my last point. Yeah. Um, and, on, and as we were working through all of those, working through the MMD, it was taking several years, but last year COVID really set up the implementation of those policies to where now most of the countries have at least a three month supply. And so what does that take? That requires your supply chain system to evolve. That requires your forecasting to evolve. So each of these health system pieces, um, really the maturing of these health system pieces around supply chain, around health information systems, having policies for managing health information, uh, health information data, really important. I think uh, you mentioned interoperability, but also the ability for cloud management um, because we're always limited by what we can have on the ground. 
And then my last point is on community-led monitoring. So we also recognize that having the community voice and feedback in a real-time way about the availability of services in a friendly way is, is critical. So two years ago, prior to COVID starting, we started in funding communities across each of our countries for community-led monitoring, where they are providing information about the sites they're going to, the quality of services they're receiving, the availability of services that they're receiving to bring those back. I think these are this is a platform where um, that has evolved from an episodic sick platform to now a wellness and a chronic disease platform is right for integration, um, not only for the systems, but for the individuals. So thank you, Doug, over to you. Thank you, Aram, um, and thank you for reminding us also of the, of the advances HIV services have, have made in terms of um, efficiencies of, of service provision, in terms of rationalization and multi-month distributions and these kinds of, 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 of gifts to the service provision community more generally, which are, are important teachings. Thank you. I'm going to jump straight to Laurel Sprague, um, Special Advisor Community Mobilization at, at UNAIDS. Um, of course, who are central to this whole conversation, who've been grappling with the integration dilemmas, um, not just with NCDs, but across a whole range of other issues. Um, Laurel, um, how are you grappling with the NCD integration question in amongst all the other integration questions you're being asked to grapple with? Laurel, welcome. Thank you so much. And, and really thank you to the Global Health Council, GMP Plus and the NCD Alliance for hosting this uh, and organizing this really important conversation. I can already tell that uh, this needs to kick off further conversations. I don't think we'll be able to properly do justice to everything um, in the Q&A, really important questions there and some of the big issues raised here. But let me try to, um, uh, to, to respond and give just a few, um, a few key points that I'd like to bring to the conversation. Um, certainly there is a lot of need for integration um, in fact, if I took a quick look through the, the new draft of the political declaration, went back to our global aid strategy that was adopted in March, and integration comes up in different ways, not only around um, NCDs and health systems, but also around financing and other issues. So, so certainly um, it, it's an important word, a uh, key word, um, and Douglas, I think it's important to bring it up. Um, I think uh, despite the multiple kinds of integration that are needed, this uh, question of NCD, integrating NCD care for people living with HIV to ensure the quality of life for people living with HIV is a top priority. And you can see, and, and you've already noted the, um, the important language. I think the language is quite brief in the global aid strategy and also the proposed language in the political declaration is quite brief, but it's powerful enough to help all of us I think, direct our energy toward um, really a focus on health systems that, that uh, or systems for health, let me say that, that meet the needs of people living with HIV across, um, across the different kinds of, of, of health needs that many of us, almost all of us have. Let me, um, I just wanted to, to note that it is challenging and many of the challenges have been raised, um, including Douglas, uh, what you called inertia, the, the difficulty in changing systems that are already in place. Um, and I think Aditya and Sally did an, a, a brilliant job explaining so many barriers. Um, I just wanted to say that I thought that your, your interventions were really the best uh, example of advocacy where we use our own stories to tell a bigger picture or to paint a bigger picture of, of what it is that people are experiencing and what we need to do about it. So, so really, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you um, for that model and for, for speaking truth to power here. Um, I, I want to add two barriers that I think have, well, maybe have been mentioned, but I think need to be mentioned again. Um, first is that people living with HIV have, have legitimate fears of losing the care they have. So whenever an integration conversation arises, um, we know health facilities are strained, both HIV clinics are strained and general health facilities are strained in many places. Um, and we know that while people living with HIV face a lot of stigma and discrimination, so do people with NCDs, um, and so do people living with HIV with NCDs. So it's something that we haven't properly attended to. 
Um, yet we do hear from people living with HIV that often HIV clinics are the safest place, um, the, 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 the least stigmatizing places, not always, but often. And so as we think about uh, questions of integration, both bringing NCD care into HIV spaces and HIV care into broader health spaces, I think we really have to be sensitive to, um, to, to the work that's been done on stigma and discrimination, making safe and welcoming spaces where we have for people living with HIV. And the other barrier I'd just like to note and then speak a minute more about um, later is um, that we haven't invested in community mobilizing um, and related to what I just said, or in stigma reduction for people with NCDs in the way that we have for people living with HIV. And I think that that will be a critical component as we move forward. So um, just, I wanted to say briefly, you know, what we need, so what we need are political commitments and we need accountability. And I think we all agree that's sort of the process for change that we've seen has been effective around HIV and other areas. Around the commitments, we do have um, these, these good commitments in the global aid strategy and the political declaration. Hopefully those, those make it through to the end. Um, and, 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 and among the, the commitment language, there is a new target. And the target is that 90% of people living with, at risk of, and affected by HIV would have access to um, resilient, equitable, publicly funded systems for health that ensure um, services for HIV and other communicable diseases. So people living with HIV, 90% should have access to services for NCDs, sexual and reproductive health, um, to address gender-based violence, mental health issues, um, and, and a variety of other um, uh, conditions are listed in the, in the political declaration in the latest version um, that I've seen. So, so I think that that target really gives us some room to move toward um, not only strong language. I mean, certainly we know that there are governments that already feel a commitment and Botswana was a brilliant example, the, 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 the presentation here, um, that it doesn't seem to me that Botswana necessarily needs to make a 90% commitment because you're already moving that way, but many governments are not. Um, and so this really helps focus attention on what needs to be done. So we need these political commitments and I think that they're coming, um, but then we need to move past that to accountability and make sure that there are, that we're supporting governments and holding governments accountable for meeting those, those, those targets. And I think uh, that to, um, to meet those commitments, there are a number of things that can be done. In the interest of time, let me focus primarily on community mobilization and community engagement. We know that community health literacy, HIV literacy, has been fundamental for PLHIV movements and for people living with HIV to claim uh, and, and, and even uh, advocate for and train their own health providers in the kind of care that, that they need. Uh, we need to invest in that for NCDs as well and for people living with HIV uh, who have NCDs and the infrastructure, the community-led organizations, the PLHIV and key population networks are out there and already able to do that. Um, and then in addition, we need, um, in addition to lit literacy, we need community organizing, advocacy, the community-led monitoring that Iram just described. And I think we should be also looking at differentiated service delivery approaches like have been used in HIV to see how those could also be applied to prevention and treatment and care for NCDs. UNAIDS is in the process of working with partners to create new GAM indicators, global AIDS monitoring indicators that would uh, speak to these uh, targets around NCDs and integrated care. So I won't speak more about that, but just to say that there, there is more to come on that as well. And, um, and that we do know, although often in small scale, there are good examples of HIV um, health clinics that have expanded their care. Um, to provide more integrated care around NCDs. So um, we, we certainly know what can be done and, and, and what is being done and, and, and can learn and build on that. And with that, I'll close my remarks and, and say thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Um, bravo, you got through your talking points with impeccable speed there. That was fantastic. <laughs> and I, and uh, yes, I think OP66B, um, I think, is the absolute. I printed it out here so I could reel it off if somebody didn't do that. And I <laughs> scribbled all over it. Absolutely right. It's a very powerful paragraph. Um, and uh, it, it, it is one to watch should it survive the machinations of the next uh, week or so. Um, but absolutely right. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and uh, we, 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 we agree with you know, all the points you make, UNAIDS is, is doing its best in the global aid strategy as well to, to, to highlight integration from the HIV perspective. And the issue of stigma is absolutely critical. And a few questions have come up on the, on the HIV related stigma being a barrier to NCD screening and diagnosis, um, particularly uh, in men, it came up. Um, thank you, Laurel. Um, I, to turn to WHO, um, is Andy with us? Andy Seal 
is an advisor in WHO who's been, we've gone back and forth on some of these questions for, for, for years now, if I uh, recall. Um, I was going to sort of look at the HIV cascade and where do we bring NCDs into this? Andy, can you just illuminate what is a complicated, complicated question, but it's a, can you just sort of simplify this for us very fast about the HIV cascade and where NCDs fit into this? Andy, hello, how are you? Hi, Doug, it's, it's great to see you. And thanks uh, to all the speakers who, who, who've gone before. It's, it's always a little easier to speak uh, later in the day because a lot of the key points have been made. So. Uh, I will actually pull out a couple of the, the salient points from others as well as, as I respond to your question, Doug. Um, so thanks again to the organizers. Um, so I, I guess I was thinking about this question about, about the cascade. And I think first of all, um, the, the very simple answer, Doug, is I think there are clearly opportunities around the care cascade, which includes screening, assessment, monitoring and, manage, uh, monitoring and management of, of common health risks including communicable diseases and comorbidities for people living with HIV. There's a couple of things I'd like to add to this. I think we should be talking about a cascade of services, not a cascade of care. We need to bring prevention into this conversation and we need to bring in people at risk of HIV or a heightened risk of HIV as well. So we need to be talking about key populations. When we bring in the prevention element, um, suddenly we're, we're able to situate our conversation a little bit more um, comfortably in a community um, uh, kind of like uh, um, setting. Um, we're keen to explore what's possible through primary health care. Um, and I think certainly if we're looking at prevention and well-being, um, which are two sides of the, of the same coin, uh, I, I think we start to see some really interesting opportunities, both around service integration, but also the critical pieces around systems integration as well that I think um, Rachel and, uh, and others uh, have already mentioned. And I think we will come back to stigma and discri discrimination every time we have this conversation um, and, and several speakers have, have already done so. So I do think that some of the critical elements around, around the systems, including governance and health work workforce, are really crucial for us to be thinking through how can we move on this. Now, in terms, terms of the cascade, Doug, um, WHO has got um, clear guidelines around how we manage this. So in terms of the clinical management piece, I think, I think we're quite clear. But as you and others have been saying here, um, it really is about looking at what does this context look like? What does the broader health um, uh, infrastructure and, and funding um, scenario look like? We, we've already heard that bizarrely, you know, sometimes you know, people who are, who, who are getting regularly screened for HIV may well have NCDs identified and picked up through those clinic visits. Men in particular rarely um, will, will, will seek out health services. Um, you know, women who, who are of reproductive age are more likely to, to, to be linked into some kind of care. Um, but once you're in the system, as it were, depending on the quality of the system around you, uh, as a person living with HIV, chances are you, you will have that. You're, you're closer to that link of having some of your um, broader health needs um, identified and met that then um, perhaps um, same age, um, non, non HIV positive people in, in, in your community. So I think those points have, have been made several times. Next point is I think WHO has been very good with the clinical guidelines. I think we're on top of the science. And I think it was good to hear from, um, from PEPFAR that, that, that you know, again, that, that partnership works very well. We've been tremendously lucky with both PEPFAR and Global Fund to have um, disease specific or disease focused funding significant amounts of funding for, for some time now um, and, and obviously that that makes it easier for us in terms of the guidance that, that we develop with it there's a clear implementation um, framework uh, around that guidance i think increasingly who will be looking to um, develop guidance around the how so we need to increasingly be looking at how do we do this in the context of primary health care how do we do this in the context of um, fewer countries now having, you know, dedicated vertical HIV programs. We're seeing an evolution already of, of that. You know, we're not in this 3-1-0 of, of 10 or 15 years ago where we had clear infrastructure, siloed um, um, support systems for HIV. It's already evolved and it's very, very much a con context specific um, issue uh, and, 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 and uh, scenario now. So again, the context is critical, the community engagement piece is critical alongside governance and health workforce. And my final point, Doug, is this is, this is a, a, a really timely um, side event for us for, for a number of reasons. 
Um, last week, or perhaps the week before now, the World Health Assembly asked WHO to develop new strategies on HIV, hepatitis and STIs to take us from 2022 to 2030. Previously, we've, we've developed these strategies as standalone strategies. We're bringing them together now with a very clear UHC and primary healthcare framework. And we hope to really address through, through that strategic framework um, a number of issues around the how. How can we um, optimize primary health care and some of the system's opportunities? Recognizing that full integration should not be the goal here. It has to be led by what makes sense on the ground, both from a people-centered perspective, but also from an efficiencies perspective. So what tools can we develop to work with countries to, to make that choice? Which elements need to be prioritized around the integration agenda? So I think that's the conversation that we're increasingly moving towards. Um, and at the global level, we're also learning from what's already happening in different regions and different countries. And as you'd suspect, it's very different depending on which region you're in. So, and what your epidemic looks like. If you've got a highly concentrated epidemic, it will be very different to, to countries like Kenya that have got more than a million people um, on, on ARVs. So perhaps Doug, I'll, 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 I'll pause there, but just to say, um, we'll certainly be looking to encourage input and feedback from all of you on, on, on this call into our strategies development process for HIV and these other areas. And the integration piece and the NCD um, interface, it will be a critical part of that. And there is a survey live, and I'll try and drop the link to that survey um, into the chat. Thanks so much, Doug. Thank you, Andy. Um, that's right. So you, everybody can pester Andy. There's an open invitation there as he as he skillfully um, puts together a new HIV strategy for WHO. Um, but there's always a time lag between good ideas and uh, you know the 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 plans that execute them. That's a natural state of affairs. But so we want to see all these things in that new plan as it integrates and brings these diseases together. So WHO has said, please go ahead, uh, and we'll be with you, Andy, as you do that. Um, thank you, Andy, for updating us on that and the, the efforts that you'll be putting in. Uh, it's a complicated task you've got, of course. So I'll, I'll, we behind time, but stick around. Kiki, you, Kiki Kel Kelstein, you've got the uh, an, envi an enviable task of singing a song as everybody's leaving the theatre, unfortunately. Um, you are the Director of Advocacy and Engagement at Global Health Council. Um, so in, in effect, you're wrapping this up for us. Um, thank you for putting this show on. Um, what what does the Global Health Council think about integration? And how can you propel this conversation? Kiki. Thank you so much, Doug. And, and thanks to everyone. It looks like we're maybe losing um, a few folks on the line, but I, I think many of you are are sticking around um, for the extension of the session by another by a few minutes. Um, and I think that 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 alone, the the participation um, says a lot about where we are, I think, as a as a broader health community um, and how much interest there is in in this conversation and, and the needed conversations around integration across NCD and HIV, broader integration as we're looking um, at all of the health goals and all of the the work that that many of us are are seeking to advance um and all of that work that has taken um taken a hit uh in in the age of covid and as we continue to grapple with the pandemic so thanks everyone for for staying on the line for um some what I'm, i've shifted a little bit into um some kind of wrap-up remarks from my view um, so thanks everyone for joining. Again, thank you so much to NCD Alliance and GNP Plus for co-hosting the session with Global Health Council. Really delighted to partner with you all. Um, thank you to all of the panelists. I mean, I saw the full list of, of speakers and I, as Doug noted in his introduction, we really had um, a slate of uh, diverse perspectives coming from different viewpoints, right? We had, um, we've had a mix of patient advocates, um, government uh, representatives <clears throat> from other important UN agencies really looking at what are the issues that we're, we're grappling with, um, with, you know, the first panel reflecting on the linkages and, and where those linkages are, and the second panel really thinking about taking what we know and shifting that that knowledge to action. And from my perspective at, at Global Health Council, I 
was just delighted to to hear and 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 really inspired by all of the the comments um, throughout this this session because we are an advocacy organization and, and GHC is a advocacy organization that's membership based. We're based in Washington, DC and much of our work is focused on advocacy with the, with the US government. Um, but we also engage broadly at, at the global and multilateral level as well. So being able to kind of hear the diverse perspectives and think about how that connects to all of our work is, is so, so useful. Um, one of the the biggest threads throughout all of this conversation i think is has been around integration obviously and for me the the thing that i find myself saying in in meetings often is that you know we look at the architecture we look at the funding streams we look at you know with um, the u.s government we have siloed funding and we have specific budget lines for HIV, you know, specific budget lines for the PEPFAR program, as Iram spoke about, you know, that incredible work that happens through PEPFAR, but specific budget lines across all the individual health areas. And, you know, in turn, we as an advocacy community are also siloed in the same way. Um, so I think it's, it's a challenge and a, and a call to action to all of us who are sitting in the advocacy space to think about how we continue conversations like this and, and think about how we um, integrate our advocacy messaging, but also align those broader asks when we're thinking about these big global moments. Um, when we're coming off the heels of the World Health Assembly and straight into um, a UN high level meeting on HIV, how do we as sometimes disparate communities from the advocacy perspective actually really thread, thread those, um, those important messages together um, in a way that's really um, cohesive, but also can have the greatest impact on making real policy change. Um, so that's the way that I, you know, the view that I was as um, thinking about through as I was listening to all of all of the speakers, all of your insights from from your um, from your work and and how we as GHC want to continue to think about um, integration broadly. And one of our key asks and broader commitments is really thinking about how we build um, how we build more equitable and resilient health systems. And as we think about that, obviously all of the, all of the work um, that you all are engaged in across NCDs, HIV and, and beyond um, links in so closely so closely to that. So I think, from from my perch, we have to think about the the messages from from these programmatic learnings, from the research that um, organizations like RTI are advancing, and and how we how we hone our advocacy messaging from um, around integration and and use these important um, political moments to to drive those those messages home. Um, I'll, I'll close and say that I think. You know, in the in the age of COVID, um, everyone on the planet has been impacted by the pandemic, and it has changed. I think how every person thinks about their own individual health, their community's health, um, the health care that they expect to have access to, that they um, that they expect their governments to, to make available to them. I think it has just really shifted um, in a way that uh, global health advocates couldn't maybe even have imagined. And uh, the way that, the, way that um, the world is, is thinking about these issues. So in, in this critical moment, while, the, <laughs> while policymakers, um, practitioners and beyond are really grappling with um, how we how we move forward in um, in in the light in light of COVID um, all of those lessons um, learned from 
you know, decades of, of HIV work and, and around integration um, and continued discussions around integration across NCD, uh, the NCD work and, and HIV work is, is just so critical. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and say thanks so much, Doug, um, for your moderation. Thanks to all the panelists. And I know we've all um, offered to stay in a few more minutes and there's a lot of great questions coming in. So happy, happy to, happy to engage in, in that discussion as well. Thank you, Kiki. Uh, thank you for um, giving us those final comments. Um, it's all about advocacy at the end of the day and pushing hard on the institutions that have the power and the money. That's our collective job. Um, I'm not going to hang around too long because I'm supposed to be giving a presentation to a, to a PAHO <laughs> seminar and they're waiting for me. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Is there any housekeeping, Hani, Nina, Katie, you want to um, put in before I just wrap up quickly? If not, I'll, I'll, I'll just silence. Okay. Um, thank you to the NCDA, GNP Plus, GHC, and thank you to, to Nina, Hani, and Omar for doing all the hard work behind the scenes. This is the easy part, really. Um, and thanks to Katie, Sally, Aditya, Robert, Rachel, John Arne, Iram, Laurel, Andy, and Kiki for all your comments. Thank you for, all, for participating. There's way too many comments and chat in the box. We had, um, wish we had way more time. These things are always too, too crowded. But thanks for engagement. I saw Andy also put the link to the um, the consultation, the HIV plan that he's uh, putting the facilitation. So do engage in that. Also, just a reminder, you know, these documents are only really as valuable as, um, you know, us following up and harassing and pestering the, the institutions who are responsible for affecting them. So the HLM document will be signed off. Um, operational paragraph 66B is the one on this question. Um, so let's really move on helping governments, imp, you know, get that working. Um, and it's our responsibility to, to highlight it, make a noise, follow up, um, and make sure it happens. It's similarly, the Global Fund a few years ago did say we will take applications from CCMs on the ground on, on HIV and comorbidities. Um, and that's there. And so let's help CCMs put together proposals on, on, um, on comorbidities. Uh, they're not coming. Um, and you know, the Global Fund is basically saying we can't, we can't make CCMs do this. Similarly, the Global Aid Strategy, as been said, is there. It's open to um, the integration question, and it's it's a Global Aid Strategy for everybody, not just UNAIDS. It's for everybody. It's the Global Aid Response. So the documents and the plans are starting to integrate these questions of integration in. So let's collectively make it all happen. Thank you for your engagement. Um, have a lovely rest of your day, however long it is, and we'll speak again soon. Good luck to us all.